All right, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for what you're doing, and we just thank you for letting us be here tonight. Lord, we, you're just so good. Man, sometimes things can get frustrating, and you just work it out, as the song said, your grace is enough, and we thank you for that. Let us just tonight, wherever we are, spiritually, mentally, physically, wherever we are, Lord, let us just take a deep breath, let it out, sit back and relax, and let you speak to us. We give you praise in Jesus' name, amen. All right. So tonight's going to be very interesting. As you can see, we're in chapter two. So what's the difference? It's taken, uh, we're, I'm taking this whole series from Fritz Rittenauer's book. So what's the difference? Again, if any of you feel like you want to uh, purchase that, go online. It's not expensive at all. And it goes uh, even a little bit more in depth than what we do here. But uh, it's, uh, it's a real good book. If any of you are interested in uh, so getting that, you can go to Amazon, what have you, and uh, pick that up. So let's go ahead and start right on in. And what, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, compare um, Christ, biblical Christianity with uh, Roman Catholicism. Now, in, in the workbook here and in his book, we call this section Other Parts of the Christian Tree. Because the, these parts, Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, still, you know, follow the Christian principle of faith in Jesus Christ is the, the main uh, segue to, into to salvation, you might say. And so we're going to take Roman Catholicism uh, this week, tonight. Next week, we'll do Eastern Orthodoxy, which a lot of the people, some of you may not be really familiar with that, but it's very similar to the Roman Catholic Church. It is actually, believe it or not, very popular in the United States, though sometimes within our own community, we may not, may, may not quite understand that. Uh, uh, Middle Eastern areas of the world, you know, you're going to find it, uh, 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 you know, really prevalent over there. Now, so here we go, Roman Catholicism, the one true church. Again, you know, my, my goal is not to bag on any religion. In fact, what my goal is, is that the leaders of these religions were here presenting their point of view. This is probably what they would say to you, okay, what, what we're presenting here. So it's not that I'm downing anything, per se, but what I am doing is comparing it to what we mean by biblical Christianity. So I think if I had a, a, a Catholic here and me being over here, probably would be saying the, whatever we're seeing on our slides and in your workbook. But you've got to make up your mind, what, what are you going to do? And so I'm basing this on my beliefs is biblical Christianity. If it's not in here, then we're, I, I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to only go by what the Bible says. Now, which raises a very interesting question, and we'll get to that so in uh, just a second, and I'm glad you were thinking of a very interesting question, but we're going to get to our plumb line, and believe it or not, I, I lost my plumb line. I know, I know. I think I left it back here, and so somehow during the course of the week, it's gone. So if you see a plumb line hanging around somewhere, so we've got a picture of one, uh, and as you know, it is, it uh, it shows vertical. What what is vertical? And so we take that to biblical Christianity, saying that the Bible is our plumb line. And this is what we're going to base off what is truth. And if anything goes either side of vertical, other than straight down, up and down on this, we're, we are not going to accept that as biblical Christianity because it's not in the Bible. So one of the things that we can really hold on to, and this is something that I would encourage you, if you memorize any verse in the Bible and you want to witness to somebody and you just don't know what to say this is probably the greatest thing you can this verse right here uh first corinthians 15 uh three through four and so it's saying christ died for our sins according to the scriptures he was buried raised on the third day according to the scriptures if you're witnessing to anybody and they'll say like to well how do you know christianity's right why why not 
other religions why christianity just say well the bible teaches number one christ died on the cross for sins now if you can find any other religion out there where their god their messiah their prophet their whoever willingly died one of the most torturous deaths that the roman government could come up with and they were very good at torture the beating before the crucifixion and then what the crucifixion was like can find anyone who willingly allowed themselves to die that way, not because they did anything wrong, but for their enemies' sake, or and all of the friends' sake, and all the world's sake, and then to have that person buried and come to life three days later. If any other religion has anything like that, then I would say there might be in contention to biblical Christianity. Uh, and so then you can go on a little bit further. Well, how, how do you know he raised from the dead? Well, we went over that last week. I mean, just kind of there's, you know, you can really get into this, but just you can easily say, well, well, number one is the fact that there were eyewitnesses. Uh, and then he appeared to many, many people. And then not only that, but we have writers like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, who literally wrote about that experience wrote about him uh, rising from the dead, uh, walking among people, even 500 at one time saw him, and uh, something had to have happened for the Roman government not to have uh, written, no, it didn't happen, it didn't happen, it's fake. We don't have that kind of thing. And then to go on and say that right after that happened, uh, at the day of Pentecost, you know, the Holy Spirit comes and Peter preaches a sermon and 2,000 Jewish people leave uh, Judaism and turn to Christ. It's documented there. There's no one refuting this. The Jews did not do that. You didn't just say, oh, I'm going to give up Judaism out of 14, 12 to 1400 years of Judaism. It was their identity. It was who they are. You just did not do that. And then when the lame man uh, got up and walked, when Peter said, you know, get up and walk, another 3,000 come know the Lord. So in a matter of five days or so, maybe a day or two, who knows, a matter of a few days, 5,000 people leave Judaism and come to the Lord. Now something had to have happened. And then for suddenly it to have spread. And then for the disciples, to have died, like I mentioned last week, that how I explained how uh, church tradition feels that they were martyred, horrendous deaths. Many, many people die believing a lie. Okay, that's all they know. They die, they might even be martyred believing a lie. But how many people do you know died this way knowing it was a lie? That just doesn't happen. And then also for it to spread in the early 300 AD, Constantine of the Roman Empire declares Christianity the major religion. Something had to have happened, you see. That's all you need to say. And you can be very dogmatic. You say, you just explain. Do you know any other religion that even compares to this? You know? And so uh, and so this, this uh, 1 Corinthians is just an incredible chapter. Now, goes on to our question, okay? Probably wondering, what was that question? Can Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox so and so be Christians? Yes, actually, anyone can. Those who receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior will be saved. Now, some of you may have seen this backpack up here, okay? Maybe you didn't, and now you're seeing it now. I'm going to do a little object lesson here. When I was with the Sheriff's Department as a reserve deputy for uh, 24 years, I was part of the uh, Sheriff's Mountain uh, Search and Rescue Team. So you've been hearing oh, lately in the news, people, we've had a number of deaths going up there. Well, my team, we were the ones, and part of other San Bernardino teams, we're the ones that would go up there and try and find them. And many of our uh, searches and different things like that were in the night because it wasn't until maybe seven o'clock or something at night, they don't come home. And then we get the call by eight o'clock. We have to go up there and climb up 10,000 feet to Mount Baldy. And the wind storms like we had the other night and snow storms. And in doing so, I would carry it back very much like this. Okay, so I, I, I would carry it on. 
but mine would be much heavier than this. Our winter packs would be 65, 70 pounds. So here we are, you can see what the back looked like. Here we carry our crampons on, we carry the ice sacks, we carry the snowshoes. Sometimes we'd have to then strip off the snowshoes and then later put them on and put our crampons on. And then later do this and that, have our ice axes be ready in case of a slip to know how to arrest yourself on the snow slopes. But I'll tell you, the 65, 75 pound pack would really get heavy after a while. And so going up in the top of Baldy, whatever, some things would have to rope up because of the icy conditions. But I'll tell you, when we got back to the command post, one of the greatest reliefs we had was taking this off. Ah, it felt good. Taking it off. Okay, that right there is very much how many religions are, especially Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodox. Are they saved? Yes, but isn't it a relief to be able to take off the burdens that some of these religions put on? We're carrying it unnecessarily. Now, granted, I had to carry this as necessity, but as kind of the closest analogy is when you suddenly get into biblical Christianity, you can take a lot of those burdens off of you and you can just, yes, thank you, Jesus for the freedom you give because your grace is enough. So can uh, some of these religions be Christian? Absolutely. But are they going around carrying 75 pounds of burden on their back? Uh-huh. That they just have to take off. So with that said, let's go on. Sola Scriptura or the Bible plus tradition. Question one, what do we mean by sola scriptura? Sola scriptura means scripture alone. And this was one of the major battle cries of the Protestant Reformation in the early uh, 1500s, early 16th century, October 31, uh, Martin Luther uh, puts forth his um, uh, treaties against the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, and so uh, this starts the uh, Protestant Revolution protesting the abuses of the Roman Catholic Church there in the 16th, early 16th century. And so he starts saying, we need to do sola scriptura, base our faith on the Bible alone. If it isn't in here, then I think we're preaching some wrong stuff. Let's take the backpacks off of us and realize that grace is enough, what Jesus did, that we don't have to burden ourselves with this. So this goes on for about 40 years or so. And then finally, the Roman Catholic Church, the Council of Trent in 1545 to 1563, this was just about maybe 30 years after Martin Luther uh, post his treaty there, the Roman Catholic Church rebuffed Sola Scriptura. Uh, they said, no, we are not going to believe in Scripture alone of the Protestant Reformation. We're going to retain the right and the power to interpret the Holy Scriptures according to what it believed the Bible said. Now, one of the passages that they were uh, would be able to uh, hold on to would be a second Timothy 3 16 to 17. So this is the one passage that they could easily perhaps take when it says all scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching. Now the Roman Catholic Church will take the position that they have the right and we'll get into why to do the teaching and interpretation of scripture. Uh, they, they, they would not say that any of us could expound on the scriptures we can only expound on the scriptures basically according to the truths that the Roman Catholic Church sets forth. They call that, uh, and then also sacred traditions that they have. And so it says, all scripture, 2 Timothy, is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. Now, According to, to uh, uh, biblical Christianity, we can teach each other. We, we can do that. We can use it to, if we need to rebuke each other for correction, for training in righteousness. 
But according to the Roman Catholic Church, it can only be done the way that the church, they interpret this. Now, I want to back up just to a couple slides here, because I did have something here somewhere. Uh, well, we'll do it the fast way. I want to go down to a white slide. And as you know, I started this last week. And right as I get to the crucial part, the screen that goes haywire. So we're doing it again. In Jesus' name, we are doing this in his name. Okay, now, so what, what is this thing about works and no works? Okay, what do we mean by like biblical Christianity? Okay, so let's redraw this again. Now let's suppose that we have uh, two sides of a bottomless pit. Okay, uh, let's do the highlighter. So here's, I like red. Okay, so here's one side going down bottomless. Here's the other side going down bottomless. God is over here and we are over here. We're, we try desperately to reach God. We're doing everything we can to reach him. So what, what we try and do is we try and reach him by doing good works. We try and reach him by maybe tithe, giving of our money. We try and do it by maybe, who knows, uh, Bible reading. We'll say that. Okay. Uh, try and giving to the poor. All these things, but it doesn't reach God. And it's over and over and over. Now, why can't we reach him? Why is this chasm here? It's because we are born with sinful bodies, sinful souls, sinful spirit. And God is righteous. And the two can't mix. And so God saw this. And so what did he do for a fix? Then to make this simple, he sent Jesus Christ as the bridge, the cross. So all we have to do is walk over by accepting his son, Jesus Christ, as our personal Lord and Savior. Not the works, not the tithing, not the Bible, not giving the poor. While all those are good, and after we accept Christ in our life, then the Spirit will work within us. So this is what we will want to do. But it's not going to get us to the other side. And God in all his love says, you guys are working too hard. I love you too much to see you condemned forever. So I'm going to put a bridge here. The cross, what Jesus did. And so the cross was Jesus. And all we have to do is walk. But how many people say, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to walk. I don't want to go across there. I want to do it my way. I want to work. I want to do it. I think if I'm a good person... I can forget about Jesus. I, 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 uh, I'll be going to heaven. But the problem is there's a bottomless pit here. There's a chasm. You can't. It's only through Jesus Christ. His grace is enough. So then here we go. Back to where we were starting. Somewhere here. So anyway, so L Luther comes up and he says, no, I think we're going to do scripture uh, so, uh, solo scripturist. So we're going to do scripture alone, only this. Well, the Roman Catholics, and like I said, a few uh, years later, about 30, they formed the Council of Trent. They said, you know, we got to do something about this Protestant Reformation, because now you got to remember the Catholic Church basically ran Europe for many, many centuries from about the early 300s all the way up to the 1500s here. Now, this is one reason why getting into a little bit of this, why a lot of times when you get into, let's say, uh, biblical prophecy, you'll hear a lot of critics say, uh, like uh, revelation interpretation and things like that, or getting into a rapture, pre-trib, okay? Uh, uh, you're going to hear a lot of people say, that's only, that's just so new, you know, during this thing, the rapture, pre-tribulation, um, what have you, premillennialism. Okay, that's only been kind of being thrown around the last couple hundred years or so. 
Well, yeah, because the Roman Catholic Church had their hand on the entire thing for uh, a, a thousand years. <clears throat> they they ran it. You know, you could be thrown into prison for going against them. Not until really the Protestant Revo uh, a Reformation takes place that the church back then, and I'm not trying to compare the church back then to today's, okay, Roman Catholic Church. They're not throwing people in prison and they're not doing this kind of thing. But I'm talking about back then, okay, uh, you could. So this is why a lot of this thing, these uh, ideas were hidden and not really brought out and the people weren't, didn't have the written word. They couldn't see for themselves. So if the church didn't teach it, then no one knew about it until really after the Protestant Reformation and people, the printing press comes out and we start reading the Bible on their own and say, well, my goodness, there's things in here we never even heard about. And so they said in the Council of Trent, they rebuffed the sola scriptura of the Protestant Reformation and retained the right and the power to interpret the Holy Scriptures according to what the church believed uh, that the Bible was saying. Now, during the Vatican Council in 1962 to 1965, uh, they confirmed and reaffirmed the uh, claims of the Trent Council at Trent and were simply upheld, but in a little different form. Now, what's very interesting here, during this Vatican Council II, uh, the documents uh, among the Vatican Council II, documents is the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation. Out comes a book, you can see it right here, and apparently it's not that big of a book, I understand you can read it in one setting, but it's called De Verbum. Now, De Verbum was an interpretation that came up during the uh, Vatican Council number two in 1962 to 1965, that basically was reaffirming the, the position of the Catholic Church. Now, De Verbum, this recognizes the Catholic ch Church assumes the correct approach to scripture plus the traditions handed down from Catholic bishops. They hold very, very strong. And if you go into De Verbum, you'll read where they openly say, declare this, that we believe in the Bible plus our sacred traditions. Now, I was listening to a very interesting podcast just this week from Bishop Robert E. Barron. He, he was, I don't know if he still is, but his auxiliary bishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. And he was uh, explaining David Bohm right here. He was trying to, he's, it's a very interesting podcast. If you want to turn it on, listen to what he has to say, how he explains this. And he basically says, and I, I, I went over it and over it until I could get the quote right, but he says how, about how to read the Bible, you read it in the light of the great teaching of the church fathers, both East and West, I'm assuming he's meaning Eastern Orthodox uh, Catholic, and within the context of sacred liturgy. So this is what he's expounding and what, what the church is saying, that the way to read the Bible is this. In fact, he even goes and says that he says, you want to just uh, go and pick up a Bible, anybody just pick up the Bible and just start reading it. And when it really makes sense, I'm thinking, yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. But he says that, literally, you look it up, you'll see. He says, no, you want to do that. You've got to have, in other words, uh, important to have it interpreted for you. And it makes no bones about it. And then he also makes it very, very clear that it's the Bible plus their sacred traditions that, that's going on. It's the backpack theory again. Why put these sacred traditions on the shoulders when Jesus says, my grace is enough? You don't need to do that. Now, uh, you don't have this slide. That's why I've got up here. You don't have this. Okay, so I got thinking about this. And when you listen to the Catholic doctrine, you're going to hear them constantly say the church, the church, the church gives the sacred traditions, the church believes this, the church has had these councils all, all through the years, whether it's Trent or whatever it may be, uh, the church. So I had to ask myself, what is the church? Is it the Roman Catholic church? Is the church an Eastern Orthodox church? Well, what does Jesus say the church is? 
Jesus says the church is the body of Christ, not a denomination, not an established inst institution. And this is something that you're going to find very, very common as we go through different religions. They base their religion on an established church as an established organization. We, we don't do that. We base it on what the Bible says. And all believers, we are the church. So I looked up a couple of verses here. 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen. 18. Uh, Paul says, he's writing to the Corinthian church. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, now this was written before the Roman Catholic Church came into existence. Okay, he's it's uh, the church was at Corinth. So he, who is who is the church? It's a body of believers at Corinth. So in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. He says, "Well, this wasn't a good thing that was happening in Corinth, but I put this out there to show you what Paul was." Uh, believing the church was not an established organization, not with a hierarchy, okay, of people, so on, but it's a body of Christ led by Jesus Christ, gaining knowledge through his spirit. Look at Acts 20, 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God. A lot of these religions are going to say the Church of God is Eastern Orthodox, the Roman Catholic, the whatever it may be, the temple, you know, no, it's the, the, the Church of God are the believers which he purchased, purchased with his own blood. Now, Romans 16, 4, Paul is uh, writing a book to the Romans here. Uh, which he had not yet visited, Rome. He is going to visit it later in chains. He says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their own necks for my life, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So even in the Bible does not recognize the church as being one organization. It's a body of believers. So you've got to really, you know, make that differentiation when we start talking about it, it's very easy to think, oh yeah, the church is dogmatic. The church tells us this. It should. No, there's no such thing as the church as far as an establishment, but it's the body of Christ. We are right here, the church, not hillside, but the body of believers. So what is the uh, church? It's the body of Christ. It's not a denomination. Now, why is sola scriptura so important? Why is it so important that we say, only what the Bible says is going to be our plumb line. If it doesn't say it, we're not going there. Evangelical Protestants believe that all the things we need to know, believe and practice are clearly stated in the scriptures, which are given by inspiration of God. Some of you have heard my uh, testimony, the testimony I've given on my dad, uh, but I'll say it again. I think it's worth uh, mentioning here. And this is kind of a little bit of rebuttal to what our archbishop was saying about, can you just open the Bible and just read it? No, it's not going to really make sense. Well, my, my dad, he was uh, in the Army Air Force Band in World, uh, in World War II. And uh, he was a very fine musician, played trombone. And so he was in Kern, Utah, stationed there. And so he was part of the Army Air Force Band. And back then, Army and Air Force were one unit. And, uh, and so he had a very, very good friend called Howard Reed, who also played trombone. They played, played next to each other. Well, in the Battle of the Bulge hit, when Germany was coming over into Belgium, and we had the line there, and Germany put that bulge into our line, Battle of the Bulge. His band was disbanded. <laughs> Howard Reed went shipped to the Pacific. My dad was shipped over to Europe. Now, Howard was trying to witness to my dad. My dad was not a believer. He's raised in uh, Salt Lake City, uh, Utah. His family were not, they were not Mormons at that time, in which time in life was a little bit rough for them not being Mormon. And uh, uh, he was not a Christian. Both his parents were alcoholics. And uh, 
severe alcoholics and addicted to, to, to tobacco. And he says their drinking parties would get so violent. He said as a kid, he'd get so scared, he'd run into his bedroom and hide under his bed. He's just so afraid. So this is what he grows up in. Well, he gets into the service and Howard is trying to tell him about Jesus in the Bible. Now, my dad is a, an incredibly, incredibly intelligent man. I do not know why it didn't rub off on me, but somehow something stopped in the gene pool, you know, and he was a, a very fast reader. He is one of those speed readers. He could look at a page and just kind of click, you know, kind of one of those things. I'm, mm, 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 mm. And, uh, and, and so, he said, it did not make any sense to me. He said, what Howard was saying to me, I didn't get it. It made no sense at all. Well, suddenly when the Battle of the Bald shit, he gets on the troop train. He's being shipped to the East Coast to go over to Europe. And they gave all the soldiers a, a testament. And he said, he's sitting there in the troop train, just kind of reading it. He says, bam. All of a sudden he said, opened up. I got it. He says, I understood what he was saying. And he gave his heart right there to the Lord. Now, the problem was he couldn't speak after that because he had a very colorful language. <laughs> and he says, I couldn't swear. He says, you know, it didn't, it didn't happen. He was a completely transformed. Well, he gets over to Germany and then uh, he's uh, uh, engaged in the battle here and they're shooting at Germans. Germans are shooting at us. You can't really tell who and where because you got bushes all, all over there. And one of our guys gets uh, shot out in the open. Brand new baby Christian. And God says, my dad, go get that guy. He jumps up, he grabs him, puts him over his shoulder, runs back. He says, I saw the dirt flying up around my feet where the Germans are trying to hit me. And he not one bullet hit him. He got into the trench, put the guy down, saved his life and got a bronze star medal. And I've got the commendation letter of that honoring my dad for that kind of bravery. See, that that's what the Holy Spirit does. And, uh, and to make a long story short, they the band, the war, the war ended. Howard went one way, my dad went another. They both kind of landed in Southern California. And then my, my brother, my twin brother and I, we grew up and we want to play trombone. So my dad says, well, we, we, we got our front teeth very early, way earlier than most kids. We looked at gophers. And so because of that, I think we were in second grade uh, my dad felt that we could play a mouthpiece instrument. And so we want to play trombone like he says, well, your arms aren't long enough. So he said, let's try trumpet. Okay. So later on, if you want to switch over, you can. Well, we never switched over. So we grew up, we were a musical family. We played in churches and different things and then went to college playing trumpet and, and all of that. It was a, as time went on, my dad got sick and he passed away. My brother and I start attending a church, and lo and behold, it's Howard Reed's church. He's still playing his trombone, and we wind up playing with him now. And so it is a full circle around. But see, this is this is God. My dad did not need uh, any interpretation. The Holy Spirit, this is divinely inspired that anyone can understand this. Now, I, I want to suggest starting like in Leviticus and reading some of these books of the law or something like that. And there are some things that commentaries are really good, especially some difficult passages, that, not especially historical things and different like this. But all in all, no, the Holy Spirit works through us. Now, Roman Catholics maintain that the Bible is a church-based book, and they say since the church wrote or at least determined what should be in the New Testament. So they feel that the Roman Catholic Church is the, basically the one that yeah, put, put this together, uh, and so therefore uh, it's, it's kind of their, their Bible, their interpretation. We evangelical Protestants would say, um, and that we would consider, or I would consider myself, I don't know where all of you stand, but I would consider myself an evangelical Protestant, okay? 
say that the church discovered the New Testament as the Holy Spirit made clear which writings were authoritative and inspired. In other words, what was happening is during the first century and that, uh, the writings, uh, all of the New Testaments uh, is written by either the apostles themselves or someone extremely close to an apostle. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, so they, they were, um, these, these books were already had the stamp of God's inspiration on them. But what started happening is around the second, third century, these new other books started creeping in. And so finally, I think it was sort of the beginning of the fourth century, the church council came, came together uh, of believers and said, look, we need to put a stamp on what we have already accepted as truth. So it wasn't like a council saying, hmm, let's throw that out, let's throw this out. Yeah, I accept that, I accept that. No, it was very strict accepting what had already basically been during that time accepted as, uh, as scripture. So no, there wasn't any church that compiled the book per se, saying this is what we believe is. Uh, the New Testament canon, I don't think you have this. You don't. That's why I put brackets. I wrote the New Testament canon was actually certified at the Council of Carthage in AD 397. So that's about the time when we started getting other books trying to warm their way into the already established epistles and uh, letters. And it was finally said, look, we, we need to put a stamp of approval on this saying that this is what has been accepted and this is what we're going to continue to being accepted is really and through the Holy Spirit's guidance, how that happened. Now, read scripture, yes, interpret it, no. During the day, verbum again, the, the little pamphlet that came out of the Second Vatican Council too, states that the manner of interpreting scripture is ultimately subject to the judgment of the church, okay, which exercises the divinely conferred commission and ministry of watching over and interpreting the word of God. Okay, uh, it, it makes it very clear uh, that it's the church's, the Roman Catholic makes it very clear that it's the church's responsibility to interpret the scripture to the people. Now, you'll hear that uh, uh, they'll say, we encourage people to read the Bible. We encourage them to read it, but interpret it the way we feel the church fathers down the line have interpreted it. Uh, we say, no, it's upon the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, Matthew 16, 13 to 20 gives the Catholic Church the claim for scriptural interpretation. Now, this is a very confusing uh, passage, and it's very interesting to go over. And I'm going to read this whole passage so we get it into context. Now, this is now when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi. Now, the reason why they call it Caesarea Philippi, there was a Caesarea on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And then Caesarea Philippi was a little bit north of uh, the Sea of Galilee. So there were two Caesareas. And so that's why they call it Caesarea Philippi to show which Caesarea we're talking about. Not that that's going to determine salvation or anything, but you know, I just thought I'd explain that. Now, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah and still others Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. He said to them, but who do you yourselves say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. Now, this is very important to understand about the Roman Catholic uh, uh, thinking here. It says, and I also say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. 
Then he gave the disciples strict orders that they were to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, let's kind of tear this one apart because this is very, very important. Now, the phrase, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Okay, and I'm just reiterating this, what I just read. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I'll give you the keys, the kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loose from heaven. So let's take this first section. That I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, according to catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, Jesus named Peter the rock of his church. Now, they're going to say that upon Peter, the church of Jesus Christ is built, because that's what it seems to be saying. So the Roman Catholic Church feels that Peter and the other apostles are the foundation of the church, because Jesus says, uh, on this rock, I am going to build my church. Now, therefore, all authority rests within the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the Roman Catholics believe in what we call apostolic succession. They believe that Jesus uh, uh, built, the that built the church on Peter and the apostles, and that they were, had the divine truth of teaching. Now, the Roman Catholics believe that the, the bishops uh, and that on cardinals, bishops, pope on down are part of the apostolic line, that the interpretation of scripture has been passed on from the apostles, because that's how the church is built on, to uh, uh, the bishops farther down, to other bishops, to other bishops, to bishops and that today. So th therefore, they are still in the line of ap uh, apostolic authority, okay? And so therefore, that's why they have the right to interpret scripture as they want, okay? And these traditions have been built up over the years because they have the authority to add to scripture as they feel they should. And so this is what they call sacred traditions, things that have been added uh, on the way down, okay, through time, through the uh, apostolic line. Now, this is where the problem comes in, and it's a major problem. Jesus does not say directly that he will build his church upon Peter himself, but upon this rock. Okay, now I have I've studied this and I've looked up in my lexicon the Greek words, and this is true. If you have a lexicon or something with Greek, look it up and you will see exactly what I'm saying here. The Greek text clearly refers to Peter as the Greek word Petros meaning a small stone. Now, when Jesus says, and upon this rock, he's not saying Peter, the Greek word is changed to Petra, meaning a very large Gibraltar size rock. So when you read this correctly in the Greek, this is what you're reading. Jesus says, and he says, Jesus is doing a play on words here. He says, and I also say to you that you are Peter, Petros, and upon this rock, Petra, I will build my church. So it says, and I also say to you that you are Petros, and upon Petra will I build my church. Well, who's the big rock? Jesus Christ is. It's not Peter. It's not that word. Look it up, and there it's clear. It's very, very clear. Jesus is not building his church on Peter. He's building it on himself. Now, what does it mean about, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven? It's not that Peter has been given the keys to, you know, uh, continue on the church, and that apostolic succession is continuing on through uh, Roman Catholic officials. Basically, what I believe this is saying is the fact that we, Christ is now giving the Great Commission, Matthew 28, go out, you know, and preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have the, the keys to preach the gospel and unlock the bondage of sin. 
Okay, we, we have been given that privilege. We have the keys to uh, preach the gospel, to unlock, but also for those who reject it, basically who reject our word that we're preaching, then has the power to bind them from the grace of God. It's not that we're binding, it's the fact that they're rejecting the words that we're saying. So before, you know, uh, you know, Jesus was the one really ministering, even though he sent his apostles out to do miracles and, you know, to, to do some preaching in that. And, uh, but he is now giving the keys to us to release the captives, to set them free. Okay. Now, uh, and, and this is very, 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 very important. Oops, let's say I went back to that. Okay, and so as the very so now uh, I believe this is my next one, isn't it? Okay, saved by faith or faith plus works. Now the Protestants rely on re another Greek word, uh, phrase called sola fide. Sola fide, and I kind of uh, phonetically spelled it out there. Long e, long a. Sola fide, faith alone for their source of salvation. The Catholic believes that Chris, the Christian must rely on faith plus good works. Okay. Now, the seven, they, they believe that part of uh, this whole salvation pro process are part of the, the, what we call seven sacraments. Okay. The very first step uh, into salvation is baptism, the, uh, the infant. And they believe that this baptism will erase original sin. Okay, we're born into sin. This baptism will erase that. The believer uh, keeps sanctifying grace only through spiritual battle, good works. Now, this is where I believe the Catholics pick up the pack right from birth and put it on. Because they believe that this baptism is going to erase original sin but it doesn't stop there. It's going to be a lifelong progression of continuing to do good works. You've got to keep doing it to, to continue. They put sanctification and justification as the same word. And I'll explain that in just a little bit. Now, confirmation is filling up the Holy Spirit. This happens at the age 12. The person is at this point sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now, let's compare that to what Ephesians says. In him, you, Jesus, in him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. So what does the Bible say how we're sealed with the Holy Spirit? Well, it's having also believed. Believe is what seals us not being 12 years old at a confirmation, it's when we believe uh, in Jesus Christ, we are instantly stamped and sealed with the power of the Holy Spirit. This is why you can never lose your salvation. People who believe that you can lose your salvation, what a miserable life. Can you imagine, have I lost it? Oh no, I did something wrong. Did I lose it? I had a bad thought. Oh, I've lost it again. You know, I, I cannot imagine people who don't believe eternal security, what they have to, must go through mentally and psychologically. No, uh, you can never lose your salvation because if someone felt they could lose their salvation, then what they're actually saying is they're stronger than the Holy Spirit that they've got the power to break the Holy Spirit's seal. Now, people can, I think, uh, backslide. Can uh, a, a Christian can uh, turn, turn against uh, uh, the rules of God and make mistakes. But I really feel that if they have really given their heart to the Lord, they're going to feel a conviction. They're going to feel a conviction, not, a, oh, hey, you know, I'm, I'm sealed, I'm free to do what I want. I mean, I, I'm not judging. I can't judge, but I would just feel that someone who's really given the heart to the Lord, there's going to be a turmoil inside, you know, I would just have to think. But we're sealed. And so this is a major difference of Catholicism and uh, uh, biblical Christianity. Now, the Holy Eucharist, meaning Holy Communion, 
They believe in transubstantiation. Uh, trans oh, gee, was transubstantiation. Yes, <laughs> get up here and I can't say anymore. Elements are transformed in the actual body and blood of Christ. They believe that we take the communion, that his body, his blood is actually becoming into you. It's transforming into you. This is a little bit different from Eastern Orthodox, which we'll get into uh, that next week. Uh, they also believe in penances, confession of sins to a priest, and the reconciliation for those sins by the sinner. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't believe uh, that... Um, justification i'm kind of getting ahead of myself but they, they uh, we believe that when a person is saved you're justified right there just as you think of it, justification just as if i had never sinned justified after we believe in Christ, we are justified, but then we do a life of sanctification, maturing in Christ, learning of his spirit, learning of his freedom, learning of his joy, learning of his peace, going on, reading the Bible, learning more and more and more of him, so we're maturing. Now, the Catholics are basically blending justification and sanctification, saying that at the time of baptism, yes, you're free of original sin, but you've got to keep, you're not really there yet. You've got to keep working and doing good works, doing penances, doing confessions through your life to try and hold on to this, basically, you know, uh, or, or you're going to be adding more years to your life in purgatory, which we'll get into. So they, they believe in confession of sins to the priest. Now, well, let me go back to this and uh, say something else. This is kind of like putting your backpack on over and over and over and over again. When is it enough? Now, I know myself and my personality enough that I know exactly how I would be if I had to live under this kind of a law. I'd go to the priest. I'd say, I did this thing. I'm sorry, I, I'm wrong. The priest then has to be the mediator to God. Through, gives me, tells me certain penances, whatever I have to do, Hail Mary, or whatever it is. I feel great. And I walk out in the steps. Guy, I get in my car. Guy cuts me off. I honk my horn at him. I yell at him. Oh, back to the church. Okay. Here I go. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I really messed up. Okay. Yeah, you're forgiven. Hail Mary's gone. Get back. Then finally, I make it onto the freeway. I'm going 75. Back to the church. I went over the speed limit. Okay. And that says that type of a sin. I'll tell you what the name of that is. Where do you ever stop? You don't. You're putting that backpack on, taking it off, putting it on, taking it off, putting it on. Christ says, no, no. When you ask him into your life, it's done. You are forgiven. Technically, you never have to ask for forgiveness again. Because you think about it for a moment. If you do something wrong as a Christian, but you feel you need to ask God for forgiveness, then you're actually saying he has something holding against you. Because if you ask a person for forgiveness, you're basically assuming that they have something holding against you. But that's not the case. So how do we as a Christian handle sin? We repent. <laughs> and what does repentance mean? You stop it. Okay? You can say, oh, God, I'm so sorry. You know, I'm sorry. But do we have to say, God, forgive me, forgive me? It's been forgiven. That's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, it's yeah, it's been forgiven. We are cleansed. But what we do is a life of sanctification now, whereby we're maturing in him. He doesn't hold stuff against us. He might be disappointed, but we haven't lost our salvation. If we have to keep asking for forgiveness, that, that means we're losing our salvation over and over. Because anytime you have to ask for forgiveness, you're admitting that you now are a sinner. And Christ died for that and made us free. So when you really think of it, we don't need to ask for forgiveness. We certainly would say, God, I'm sorry. I'm repenting, meaning I'm turning a 180 from doing what I did to now not doing it anymore. 
but we are cleansed. We don't have to keep going back and doing penances and different things like that. We're free in him. The backpack is off. Don't put it back on. Now, one of the other things, anointing the sick. Now, this, this is very biblical. Uh, called it, um, formally called extreme unction, prayer and anointing of a sick or dying believer in the faith of the church. Holy orders. Again, they've got hierarchies. Catholic ministers are ordained at three levels, bishops, presbyters, priests, or presbyters and priests, and then deacons. And so this is their holy orders. Well, in biblical Christianity, we all are righteous before God. There are no orders. We, do, there, we don't have priests. Jesus is the mediator. He forgives us once and for all. When a person just simply says, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I'm yours. Bam, instant transformation. We're a child of God. Sins are wiped clean. They are forgiven. And we don't have any other person higher than us. We are all in the family of God, okay? And uh, 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 in the family of uh, his kingdom. Now, matrimony, marriage, divorce and remarriage will cut the Catholic off from the Eucharist, the communion, but not from the church. We are never cut off from the love of Jesus Christ. Does the Bible say that? Nothing, no powers, no heights, no anything will ever separate us from the love of God. Uh, no matter what sin you ever commit after salvation will never, ever, ever cut you off from uh, the love of God. For any Christian who goes around feeling unworthy, you don't need to do that. Christians who think I'm unworthy to take communion. No, you are very worthy because God calls you righteous. You are perfect. You are Sabbath. Sabbath means rest. A lot of people say, well, how can we Christians don't observe the Sabbath? We do. For Christians, the Sabbath is Jesus. The Sabbath is not a day. The Sabbath, read Hebrews chapter 4. The Sabbath is Jesus. When we diminish the Sabbath to being a day, we're minimizing what the Sabbath means. Sabbath means perfect perfect rest. Why did Jesus commission the seventh day to be a day of rest? Because he said, everything is good. I don't have to do anything else. So he makes that seventh day holy. Now, the, the Jews growing, uh, going through had to observe that because after all, think of the comparison of their seventh day and God's seventh day. They would rest on the seventh day and have to think, man, I really messed up this week. I, I'm, I'm not holy. I've got to kill a lamb. I've got to do this. And God is saying, but there's a Sabbath day coming whereby you will have perfect rest, not of a day, a spiritual rest. So when Jesus died on the cross, he became our Sabbath. So when we ask Christ into our life, he looks and says, you are good. You can rest, okay? So it's not a day. That's minimizing. I believe that's just really minimizing what the Sabbath is to a Christian. The Sabbath is Jesus. Jesus Christ is our rest, no longer a day. Now, uh, the Holy Eucharist and penance are two very significant differences between, again, Protestants and um, Roman Catholics. Christians do not need continuing uh, forgiveness. We don't have to do penances, Hail Marys, or whatever works to regain our right relationship with God. We don't need that. Hebrews 9.27 on, it says, And just as it is destined for people to die once, and after this comes judgment. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly wait him. So when a Christ comes for his second coming, he's not going to come with reference to sin because we are already declared righteous. We are living in his Sabbath, his perfection. 
So if all of a sudden he came without reference to sin, and according to Catholicism, I haven't gone to the priest yet to confess my sin. Well, it's not jiving with what's being said here. He's coming without reference to sin. That must mean I must be clean. Look at this next thing. For the law, the uh, Hebrews lived under the Mosaic law, the laws of Moses. For the law, since it is only a shadow of the good things to come and not the form of things itself, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually every year, make those who approach perfect. In other words, when you live under a law of, whether it's the Old Testament law of sacrifices and that, or whether it's a law of uh, any other religion, okay, you're never perfect. You're, you're always having to go back and go back. Well, Christ says, otherwise, they, they would uh, not have ceased to be offered. If, if those sacrifices made you per perfect, you want, they would not have had to do it over and over and over and over. But having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there's a reminder, reminder of sins every year or every week when they had to observe the seventh day as a Sabbath. Okay. Um, four. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls, bulls and goats to take away sins. Same as going to a confession. The priest can't take away your sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, you have not desired sacrifice and offering. He's not desiring us to confess and confess and go over and over, but you have prepared a body for me. You have not taken pleasure in whole burnt offerings and offerings for sin. He's not taking pleasure in the Hail Marys and all this we have to do and works and that. Then uh, now, the, now the, this is quoting Jesus. Then I said, behold, I, Jesus, have come. It is written of me in the scroll of the book to do your will, O God. After saying above sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you haven't desired this, nor have you taken pleasure in these works. Okay. Then he said, behold, I have, Jesus says, I've come to do your will, Father. Okay. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Now, the word sanctification here can actually be kind of used to a couple ways. And this, in this reference here, it's kind of being used the same as justification. Okay. In other words, once we have uh, come to know Jesus, we are justified, just as if I had never sinned. Justified. Uh, in this case here, they're using sanctification. But most of the time, sanctification means after we've been justified, then we mature in Christ. That's sanctification, being set apart from the world to do God's will. Then uh, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifice, the same penance, the same penance, the same penance, which can never take away sins. <laughs> But he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time. So do I have to keep asking God for forgiveness? 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 No. It's taken care of for all time. Then Jesus sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And in this case, meaning justified. It's a one-time thing. We don't have to keep repeating over and over and over. Christians do not need continuing forgiveness. We don't need that. Christians do not need penances. Catholic, Catholics believe in mortal sins. These are grave sins that, uh, like murder and different things like this, and also uh, venial sins, less serious offenses. In God's sight, a sin is a sin. If you take a purified drinking water and put a tiny drop of dirty oil in, you've got dirty water. If you put a whole, you know, half a glass of dirty oil in, you still have dirty water, you see. So in God's sight, there's no greater sin, lesser sin. The least of all sins would have sent Jesus to the cross, because the least of all sins, Adam and Eve just 
taking a bite out of a fruit. That, that seems pretty, you know, not very bad. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> lack of another word. Other than Christadology, God told him not to. The smallest of sin. We There's no grades of sin. Sin is sin. Okay. Now, um, Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. We are all sinners. So can a priest take away, uh, mediate between a sinner when they're a sinner too? Okay, unless they've asked Christ for forgiveness, but even then it's only God who takes it away. Look at Ephesians, for by grace, and some of these verses I repeat, but it's kind of worthy. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. Okay, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's sanctification. After we come to know the Lord, we we, we set ourselves apart, okay, from the world. And we, we, we try and follow his way because that's the good way of life. Okay, uh, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so we would walk in them. Now, our works are a result of our faith. Okay, because we believe, then we do good works. Now, how do Catholics view salvation? Catholics believe that Christ's blood has become the instrument of atonement for the sins of all men. However, they insist that faith in what Christ did on the cross in and itself is not still good enough, okay? It's still not good enough. Catholics believe that the justification and sanctification are considered as the same. So in other words, what's a saving process? You've got to continue keep doing good works because you can fall back and God confess a sin, fall back and confess a sin. It's uh, the Christ's death on the cross isn't a one-time forgiveness. Okay, that's why you've got confession. Now, Catholics believe faith in Christ is the beginning of salvation, which lays the foundation for justification. But the Catholic will then build on this by having to do good works through life. See, justification translates in the Greek as dikaio. This means to recognize or to be declared righteous. So when Christ declares us righteous, we are righteous. We're not a drop of dirty oil in a clean glass of water. There's no dirty oil at all. Now, salvation comes by only one way, and that's faith. Not through penances, it's through faith on what Christ did for us on the cross. I'll read these quick. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things, Paul is writing, uh, and count them to be rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith. Look at John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. Okay, right there, eternal life, uh, done and over with. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him won't perish, John 6. Therefore, they said to him, what are we to do so that we may accomplish the works of God? Jesus answered, answered and said, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. Nothing in there about penances, nothing in there about working. Okay, this will clear up misconceptions of James 2. Now, a lot of people will misuse this. It says, what use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he doesn't have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, yet you don't give them what is necessary for the body, what use is that? In the same way, faith also, if it has no works, is dead by being by itself. Now, a lot of people will say, see, you've got to do works on that. No, what this is saying here is if a Christian is... Uh, uh, justified through faith. Now we go into sanctification, a maturing process. Well, what good is our faith 
Yes, we are saved. We'll go to heaven. But if we never try and draw closer to Christ, we never try and help, you know, uh, uh, anybody. We never share that. W what good is it doing anybody? Well, it did us good. We're going to heaven, but it certainly isn't doing anything else. So we got to go back again, um, saying uh, Philippians, it's through faith in Jesus Christ not faith and works. What James is trying to say that if you have Christ in your life, works are going to happen. You see, they're, they're, they're going to. You know, if you have brand new batteries and a flashlight, you put the switch on, you are going to have light. <laughs> okay, if we have new batteries of the Holy Spirit, we are going to have light, uh, is this. But it's not the fact that uh, the works is making us saved. No, it's the reflection of what's going to happen. Uh, he who believes has eternal life over and over and over. He believes will not perish, but have eternal life. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So it's belief, 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 belief. You don't have this one. But see, sanctification is not just the declaration of mouth. I, I, I In your book, I, I gave... A wrong word, I think. I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote this, put it in. I probably misread something in this book, but I probably should have said sanctification is not just the declaring of the mouth. In other words, you don't just say, I'm mature, I'm mature, I'm mature, I'm saved, but I'm mature unless we're trying to be mature. Yeah, that's kind of all I was trying to mean. It was supposed to be James 2.18. Um, anyway. Uh, now, how do Catholics and Protestants then view sanctification, the maturing process? Protestants see sanctification as the progress, progressive work of growing in Christ and being mature. Works are very important to the evangel evangelical Protestant and to the Roman Catholic, but we, but we view them differently. Works. Okay, we believe that we are justified, we're declared righteous through faith in Christ, and this naturally leads to the fruit of good works. Turning on the flashlight naturally is going to give you a bright light. The Holy Spirit in us naturally is going to want us to get to know Christ, to please him, to obey him. As we grow in Christ um, in the Christian life as God has planned for us to do, then we understand real life. Again, for by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourself works. It's the gift of God, not a result of work. So that clears up that James statement. Okay, when you read the Bible and work, sometimes you get what seems to be conflicting passages sometimes. Okay, what you want to do whenever there's a conflicting passage, take what is clear, what the Bible says is clear, like this, okay? not a result of works. Then take the James passage, said, what good is faith without works? And then you compare it to what we know is clear. Well, James must not be, if this is saying it's not of works, then I must be misinterpreting what James is saying. So obviously James is saying that if I have faith, works are going to come. And what good is my faith to others if I don't display it. So that's the way you want to interpret difficult passages that seem like I read this, and, oh, whoa, whoa, is that saying I can lose my salvation? Well, stop, read the verses that say, no, you can't. Then take that and go back to what seems to be the contradiction and say, okay, now, now what is that really, really saying? And that really helps clear up stuff. Now, Catholics, however, do not believe that faith alone provides justification, but they must work for justification all their lives. I'm going to bust through this. Catholics blend justification and sanctification together. In other words, they don't believe that we are fully justified, okay, um, uh, at the time of salvation or the baptism, infant baptism, but that we continue to be justified and sanctified at the same time as we go through life doing good works. Now, purgatory, let's get into this. Okay, Catholics believe that they do not pay sufficiently the temporal punishment for our sins through their acts of penance. 
So even though you do what the priest says to absolve sin, it doesn't wipe you totally clean. It's like changing oil on your car and all you're working on it. You take the shower, you look, you still got dirt under your fingernails. Well, that's kind of how it is here. Yeah, the penance is going to wash, but you're still going to have dirt under your fingernails. So you can't go into heavenly God with purity with dirt under your fingernails. So therefore, you've got to go into some kind of a heavenly bath that they call it purgatory. It's a special place of cleansing where payment for sin is completed and believers are now made fit for heaven. Um, part, part of the Catholic reasoning for purgatory is that because sinners have failed to make themselves perfect, they wouldn't be happy with an all-perfect God, would feel very embarrassed going in God's kingdom with dirty fingernails. So we wouldn't be happy there, would be very uncomfortable. Besides, all of a sudden you realize your elbows are greasy too. So we need purgatory to make us right. Well, uh, Revelation 21, and nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is the end of Revelation talking about the, the New Jerusalem, that all, all believers will have a chance to go into it because once our names are written in it, okay, we are going to be with Christ. I've got some other neat verses on that. Purgatory, the purgatory is not a torture chamber. It's a place where the soul submits to the burning, purifying love of God. It's a place where we're getting the dirt out from our, under our fingernails. The soul sheds itself of immature self-love and the real self emerges perfectly. So when we get out of perfect purgatory, our elbows are clean, our fingernails are clean, and we're ready to go in God's presence. Well, it's, it's not what the Bible says. Well, go on. So what do we mean by indulgences? Okay, now there's penances where you try and work off the sin and there's indulgences. Catholics believe those in purgatory cannot necessarily help themselves always, but Catholics left back on earth can enable them to obtain heaven more quickly by praying for them, offering mass for them, doing forms of good works, which includes gaining indulgences. Okay, see, this is where the Catholic Church believes in these sacred traditions. As time went on, they believed that the, the bishops and that, because they're an apostolic line uh, of the apostles, that they have the right to interpret scripture in new ways. So you don't read this in the Bible, but they say, but... It's through an apostolic line that they've come up with new things outside of the written word that are as basically as scriptural. Again, indulgences are one of them. It's not in the Bible. You won't find it there. And they'll say, yes, but it's one of our sacred traditions, which to us is as important as what you're going to read in the Bible, basically is what they're saying. Now, according to catechism, those seeking indulgences want to shorten their own or someone else's time in purgatory. Like it seems like this lady is possibly trying to do someone who's in purgatory to get them out sooner, get those nails clean. Prayers and good deeds are two acts that can be endowed with a privilege of indulgences. Okay, the Catholic Church uses the power originally given to Peter to bind and loose sins. And, and so that's the one I said, says the keys of heaven will be given to you to bind and to loose. Well, that's not what scripture is saying, that we can loose those in purgatory. I believe what it's saying is we have the power to preach the gospel, to loose people from the sins that bind them. And if they reject our word, then the sins that bind them, will they will remain bound, not being bound and loosed in purgatory. Since the church is built upon Peter, they say, and we've already established that fact, the church was not based on Peter, it was built on Christ. The church can intervene in favor of individual Christians by opening for them a treasury of merits of Christ and the saints. So there's like a treasure box of merits that when you um, gain indulgences, it's favor. You're gaining favors that come out of this wealth of um, uh, treasure 
Okay, so I'll read it here. It makes more sense. Indulgences mean that God is indulging, being kind to, by giving the believer from an exhaustible supply of spiritual merits that have accumulated in the church's treasury through the work of Christ and the prayers and good works of the Virgin Mary and the saints. So these are, again, sacred traditions that are not in the Bible, but they hold. An indulgence is a kind of pardon for sin that can be partial or complete. Again, the Bible does it say that he declares us righteous, not partially righteous. We are fully righteous. A complete indulgence can be granted only by the Pope. My Bible says a complete uh, indulgence can be granted by Jesus Christ fully. A partial indulgence can be granted by bishops, archbishops, and cardinals. No, not according to biblical Christianity. These partial indulgences are usually expressed in units of time, days, or years. These indulgences lessen the time that one will stay in purgatory. There's nothing in the Bible that even hints the purgatory. But again, these are these, you know, uh, uh, the things that has the church has gone up through a apostolic succession, these sacred traditions, they call them, that they've placed on themselves. I mean, think of the bondage living under this kind of a law. Uh, how, how many acts do I have to do to get my relative out? Have I done enough? Well, maybe I'm not doing as much as this person is doing. Well, they're doing more than me. Maybe I better try and up, uh, one up them. At what point am I good enough? See, that's the problem. That's the problem with people who believe that you can use, lose your salvation. At what point do I lose it? Have I lost it? Where is the freedom in that? Christ gives us freedom not to put these backpacks of burden on us. Um, the, uh, let's see this. Oh, next slide. That's a repeat. I did that slide twice. Now, how do Catholics view Mary? And we'll just kind of, oh my goodness, where does time go? Uh, we'll, we'll go. Uh, early Catholic teaching stated that Mary's virginity continued after the birth of Jesus, that she never had any more children. Well, look at Mark 6, 3. It says, with Jesus' brothers, James, Judas, Simon, Joseph, or Joseph. Same thing. Well, Lissa's brother. So how can we say that, you know, she, she was uh, never had any children? Other traditions uh, include the Immaculate Conception. Mary was conceived without sin, lived a sinless life. That's nowhere in, in the Bible. Only one person did that. That's Jesus. That Mary and the Assumption. Mary was taken up body and soul directly into heaven. Okay, nothing about that. Beginning in the late 19th and continuing the 20th century, Mary has held a position as co-mediator with Christ between God and man. No, there's only one mediator, mediator, 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there's one God and one mediator also between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given out of the prophet. A priest is not a mediator. Mary's not a mediator. The mediator is Jesus Christ. Now, the major differences between Roman Catholics and evangelical Protestants, again, summing up, Catholics claim that scripture and sacred tradition are equal in authority. They're equal. These sacred traditions are equal to scripture. Protestants say the Bible is the sole guide for faith and practice, and we've gone through all those verses that it's by faith, and we won't go through those Rome says that teaching authority of the Roman church has, has, has been entrusted to interpret the Bible for Catholics who are not able to interpret themselves. Protestants say that the individual Christian can trust the Holy Spirit for guidance as they read and interpret the Bible for themselves. We can look at those scriptures. kind of good. Catholics teach that Peter was the first pope and that through apostolic succession, other popes have succeeded him, each serving as vicar, substitute, or agent of Christ. No, Christ was one and all. Okay. A Protestants believe that Christ is the foundation for the church. Catholics uh, misunderstand Matthew 16, 19. Again, Peter being translated as Petros, uh, small stone. Well, th this rock is translated Petra, bedrock, massive rock. 
Jesus is Petra. Catholics teach that the Pope is infallible when he speaks on matters of faith and morals. Again, Protestants reply that no human being is infallible and only Christ is head of the church. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, Pope too, and fall short of the glory of God. If it isn't true, then someone has got to be lying here or horribly mistaken. Is it the Bible or is it the Catholic sacred traditions? You can't have one saying all have sinned and the other saying there's some here that haven't. So there's a disconnect there, okay? So something's got to be wrong. He put, uh, and he put all things in subjection under his feet, made him head over all things to the church. That's Jesus, which is his body, okay? Now, Catholics claim that salvation is secured by faith in Christ, plus good works and grace conferred through the seven sacraments of the church. Protestants say that salvation is secured through faith alone in Jesus Christ, his atoning sacrifice on the cross. Catholics blend justification, sanctification in one process. You're being saved through life, and you're being matured through life. Protestants say, no, you're saved once, justified, but then you do a lifelong process of becoming uh, holy. Catholics believe they cannot pay for all their sins, so you got to go through purgatory. Protestants believe they're justified by faith, Christ, and nothing else. They'll go straight to heaven. And before I end this, look, for it says, um, 2 Timothy, Paul is saying, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. In the time of my departure has come. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the courts. I've kept the faith. In the future, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award on me that on that day. And not only to me, but also all to have loved is appearing. He's just saying that when I'm leaving this body, I'm with Christ. He says it to the Philippians, but I'm hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. So he, he knows when he departs, he's not going into purgatory, he's going to be with Christ. Look what Jesus said to the guy on the cross. He is saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said, truly, I say to you, today, you'll be with me in paradise, not purgatory, paradise. Okay, so with that, uh, so where does this leave us? That leaves us with freedom. And what, what does that do as we go out tomorrow, whatever, meet our people? Did you get the chance to witness? The only thing you can say is Jesus Christ is my freedom. Okay. He's my freedom. I don't have to have all this stuff put on to me. I believe that he died for my sins. He was buried and he rose the third day. And there's enough proof just in itself to know that. And so we are, we are free. And for you to go out today knowing you are free. You don't have to be shameful for anything in your life. You've given light your life to Christ. You're free. You're white. You're pure snow. Hold your head up high and just uh, 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 thank God and follow his paths. <laughs> So let's pray. Father, thank you for all of this that we've learned. We are free in you. We don't have to feel shamed. We don't have to feel uh, second to anybody else. We're, we are resting in your Sabbath. Jesus is our Sabbath. We're resting in him. And we don't have to do works. We thank you for this freedom. And we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.